check out the word of my Norse god of sponsorship. The Vikings game just had a massive update. There are new RPG elements and a new hero. You choose your own game style, build up your cities and economy, or rule through diplomacy, or use a huge army to destroy your enemies. I advise making sure the food, iron and silver are plentiful before waging war. Binkov knows no army can fight on skill alone. Check out why 12 million players are so addicted to it. Support my channel today, download Vikings from the links below in the description. You'll get your initial protection shield for free and my special bonus of 200 gold for a fast and successful start. Привет. Hello. We're discussing EU versus Russia. In this second and final part, we will explore how would the full EU alliance do against Russia occupying Ukraine and possibly other bordering nations. Both sides start with full initial willingness to fight. No other allies are involved in any way and nukes are not an option. For those who believe lack of European unity would lead to a smaller European alliance, part 1 covered that option. Do also watch it for other aspects not covered in this video. Belarus is this time a Russian ally, granting its territory and forces to it. Ukraine is considered as completely dissolved and busy fighting with itself, with no remaining armed forces. So what would be different if whole EU went to liberate Ukraine and protect the Baltics from Russia? Air power balance would change, so EU would control much of the front though still with a steep casualty cost. EU has twice as many fighter jets and difference in number of technologically advanced fighters is even bigger. Front control would be aided by European more advanced and more numerous airborne support platforms. Russian air forces penetrating over the front would thus lead to unacceptably steep losses. Russians would play defensively, counting on their air defenses to help them out. And that they would, as their advanced SAM inventory is Russian's biggest trump card. It would make deep incursions into Russia next to impossible and would prevent carefree ground support sorties for the EU strike fleet. EU would gradually accumulate losses and their air power edge would over time diminish. Of course, by that time, Russian air forces would be basically halved and confined to occasional harassment strikes. EU would have to choose between time-consuming and risky relocation of their air bases closer to the front and poor sortie rates if much of their air forces operate from home bases. Their fairly potent aerial refueling fleet, however, would mitigate some of those issues. With air defenses and air forces neutralizing each other, the two sides would be left with organic ground-level firepower to support their troops. But before we dwell into that, let's look at overall army numbers. EU has a comfortable edge in every segment, especially when it comes to actual trained reserve. EU paramilitary, though, may not be able to project much of its manpower past their country's borders, though they could form the cornerstone of a mass mobilized army if conflict lasts for a year. As talked about in the first video, EU's biggest issue would be bringing the forces to the battlefield. Most of the Russian forces would start fairly close by but EU would need to assemble forces from great distances. Complete EU would have some rapid reaction forces, but those are still fairly minor formations, especially if EU plays catch-up after Russia is already prepped for taking Ukraine. While transport planes would work overtime, getting whole brigades with thousands of their vehicles to the other side of Europe would, with very little exception, require rail and road transport. It would take months for EU forces to assemble large army groups capable of penetrating Russian defenses. Britain would need to hold them through the tunnel or over the sea, while Spanish troops would have quite a bit of traveling to do. Since both sides would transport troops from afar, both sides would try to disrupt those lines by air and cruise missile strikes. Russia does have a sizable bomber fleet, while EU has no such aircraft. But Russia doesn't have that many cruise missiles, as half of their fleet is specialized for anti-shipping missions. Russian overall ballistic and cruise missile inventory slightly lags behind in numbers, but their overall range is greater. EU rail transport infrastructure would be continuously harassed. Russians, faced with a potentially overwhelmingly strong enemy, might preemptively strike not only at Ukraine, but also try and take as much territory as possible before EU armies assemble. That includes taking the Baltics, trying to hold on to Kaliningrad, overrunning Moldova and possibly even going into Finland a bit. 
Not all those gains would be done to hold them, but to slow down enemies' approach, make them go through a larger territory and destroy their roads and infrastructure. The larger front would however stretch the Russian forces, especially the addition of Finnish front and the need to protect its northern fleet's base near Murmansk would tie a sizable part of Russian forces, stretching their army numbers. Indeed, with Baltics being threatened, both sides are more likely to concentrate more to the north. Russia might be forced to take a completely defensive stance in Ukraine. Russian initial scramble would see most of the Baltics cut off, as Russia might go through Belarus first, instead of wasting time occupying the Baltics. That's not to say Russia would not go for the three Baltic states as well, but it would not be the first priority. Cut off Baltic states would be easy prey later on, even if reinforced by EU by air and sea. When finally ready, EU would likely attack on a wide front, including pressing on through Finland towards St. Petersburg and try and cut off Murmansk. Part of the British forces could be ferried to Sweden, then travel to Finland by roads joining the Scandinavian effort towards Russia. EU surveillance and recon assets are more numerous and more advanced. But realistically, neither side would be able to hide large army groups and have them perform surprise attacks. Besides UAVs, helicopters of various kinds would be used for recon and attack, an area where EU has an upper hand, though both sides' air defenses might neutralize a good deal of such assets. Better and more numerous tactical recon platforms would however aid EU in local temporary buildups of forces for added local numerical superiority of its troops. Previous videos said partial EU Navy would neutralize Russian naval threat but could not aid much in the overall war effort. The naval conflict would make only a little more sense with full EU alliance. With Russian fleets dispersed and being so far from each other, only the Pacific fleet could realistically join with the Northern fleet. But even if they try, they would be badly outnumbered by a more technologically advanced opponent. Option of getting the Pacific fleet to Mediterranean is not realistic, as even if logistics hold, EU fleet would be waiting for them at the Suez choke point. It is all but impossible Russia could exit the Black Sea with balance of power shown. But equally so, European navies could not go into the Black Sea, due to international regulations and neutral Turkey. Of course, politically more realistic scenario might go differently, but that is outside the scope of this video. European Baltic fleet would equally prevent the Russians from doing much in the Baltic Sea. But it would also be quite in danger of Russian air power, so actually making landings around Baltic states or blockading St. Petersburg would be unlikely. Pushing north around Scandinavia may be plausible for EU naval might, but as they get closer to Murmansk, Russian smaller craft would enter the fray as well as sizable Russian naval aviation. Russian submarines would also be better utilized defensively, but EU has a vast fleet of anti-submarine helicopters and enough ships to hold them. Still, proximity to Russia would mean Russian land-based air forces would negate all the European advantages. EU would risk losing much of their fleet to Russian air force and coastal defenses for little to no gain. In the end, most likely outcome is that Russia would keep its fleets very close to its home, but on alert for any possible EU fleet incursion into the Baltic Sea. If that happens, Russian northern and added Pacific fleet might sail into Atlantic to relieve the pressure on the Baltics. Still, EU could afford to use a good deal of their air defense ships in the Baltics, helping in the much needed air war. Eventually, EU fleets in the Baltic Sea would be joined by most of its amphibious landing assets, threatening Kaliningrad or other areas not as close to St. Petersburg. But even if landings are performed successfully, quite close to the front line in the Baltics, they would be but a drop in a bucket. Russian hardware numbers are pretty inadequate against the whole of EU. Fast early gains, before Europe assembles its forces, are crucial if Russia hopes to retain some of the conquered land. The artillery, unusual Russian strong point, is an area where Russia lags behind when compared to whole of EU. While Russia does have thousands of old Cold War era guns and armored vehicles parked around in vast graveyards, there simply isn't enough trained personnel ready to man them. Russian armed forces would need to increase several fold first, 
Even so, most of these new units would be manned by reservists with little real training when it comes to combined arms operations. It is unlikely that but a fraction of equipment could be put back into service. First several months of the war would be unlikely to bring much movement over the front. But once the European armies consolidate, Russian coalition could only steadily retreat while inflicting the attacker somewhat bigger casualties. Russia has no area in which it has an upper hand except the air defenses, but air defenses are a niche defensive weapon. With weaker ground forces, those air defenses could not play a role in the offense as there would be no offense. Eventually, the European might would mean the overall casualties would remain comparative to Russian ones. As said, more numerous forces, greater battlefield mobility and better aerial recon would help concentrate EU units more efficiently and result in local overwhelming numerical advantages. If political willingness to fight remains high for both sides, EU coalition could overwhelm Russia with numbers. After a year, a huge number of mobilized conscripts could aid the Europeans. It might be bloody, but eventually EU would win this fight, through sheer numbers and technology. But for EU to succeed in the real world, it would be imperative to either have powerful allies like the US, or to have full support of its peoples and foreign policy. Because if the EU military coalition loses an important member or two, if it can rely only on the country's professional soldiers, if mass mobilization does not happen, and if EU economies do not switch to wartime production levels, overall EU strength would be almost halved, and thus the end result would be closer to what the first video in this series suggested, instead of a victory. And of course, such large-scale war could lead to nuclear weapons use. EU lags quite a bit behind there. Though realistically, we would already be talking about US involvement by then, and a global nuclear catastrophe. Did you know you can buy Binkov's t-shirts? Hop over to our store at binkov.com and pick a design you like. It doesn't have to be just a t-shirt, there's all sorts of goodies waiting for you. Get in touch with your inner commissar. As usual, feel free to subscribe. And if you really like my videos, you can support me via the above link through the Patreon crowdfunding website. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.